أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين المبعوث رحمة للعالمين شفيع المذنبين وحبيب قلوب الصادقين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل وعلى أهل بيته الأطيبين الأطهرين الهداة المهديين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today, inshallah, we will move into another phase of our discussion of the uh, conversations with Allah that are described in the Qur'an that refers to a little bit of introspection on the part of the believers and how that introspection is to take place. But before I do that, I would like to discuss one of the verses of the Qur'an which we find describes a little bit of the importance of du'a and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this isn't our main topic during uh, these talks that we have had. What is the philosophy of du'a and what is the manner of connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it is a topic that is closely related to be able to appreciate these du'as and to be able to benefit from them for us to be able to know well, what is the philosophy of du'a in Islam? Now, there are many of us who would like prayer to be kind of a blank check from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we think that if we do our Creator the favor of acknowledging Him and speaking to Him, then He should return the favor by giving us whatever we want and doing whatever we ask for. And so we often feel somewhat pessimistic about whether our prayers will be answered. Sometimes we actually have objections and there are people who will tell you that's the last time that I make dua. I'm not going to say uh, anything else to God. I'm not going to call on Him. I made a prayer for so many years and it was not answered. Now there are many ahadith that speak of some of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does postpone prayers. And there is a beauty and a wisdom in having a prayer delayed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of those ahadith, which is especially beautiful, is where we are told that there are two types of voices that are raised to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is the voice that comes from a true, sincere believer and it goes to the heavens and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is the voice of one of my true, faithful believers. And I love to have this person turn to me, to speak to me, and so let me postpone putting off or fulfilling their prayer. Because if I fulfill it, Immediately, they may not think to speak to me again so soon. The person who can probably best relate to this hadith is a mother who has a teenage child or a child in college. They will call their children and then just try to figure out something random to say, maybe a piece of advice, a question, something to keep the conversation going. Have an excuse to call the child without offending their sensibilities and say, well, I just needed to tell you this or remind you about this. Did you remember your cousin's birthday? These types of things, a parent can easily relate to how sometimes just hearing the voice of somebody you love is important. But the other person may not always appreciate the importance of hearing your voice and allowing you to hear theirs. And so then you have to find some indirect way of bringing them in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his love for humanity, he wants us also to connect to him in the same way. But sometimes we don't appreciate it. And so Allah uses an indirect way. He says that at least 
if the person is a believer, they're going to keep turning to me. They're not going to uh, get misguided and think that, well, somebody else will be able to solve their problem. They know that I am the solution. So let me put it off a little bit. They will keep on calling on me, and they're going to benefit. They will form a stronger connection. But then there are other people who call on Allah, they make a dua. But Allah says, this is a person whose voice I don't want to hear. And I don't want to have them keep on calling on me. And he tells his angels, hurry up, give them what they want. So they get up. Now the interesting thing is, those are also people who are making dua. They're turning to Allah. It's not like they're asking somebody else for the fulfillment of their needs. They're turning to Allah, and Allah is going to fulfill their needs. But because they're not doing it to make a relationship with their creator, they have a utilitarian mindset. This is what I need? All right, who, can, who, can, who is the contact that I have that can give me what I need? They go through their phone book or their Blackberry or whatever it is that people use these days, and they find out that there's nobody in this world who can fulfill their need. And then they realize that they do have a contact, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they turn to Allah just as they would have turned to a friend if a friend would have been able to fulfill their need. Allah may fulfill their need because His mercy is not limited. It comes to believers, unbelievers, hypocrites, polytheists, atheists, all are able to benefit from Allah's mercy in this world. And so Allah will fulfill their prayer, but He won't allow them to develop a relationship with Him. And yet those who are sincere, He will say that the prayer, the need itself is just an excuse for that person and for Allah to connect to them and develop a relationship with them. And so in this hadith we see very beautifully illustrated the idea that the fulfillment of a specific need in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as our creator, our Lord, our sustainer is secondary. It is an excuse. But it is the connection between the servant and the master that is important. And that is what Allah focuses on. That is what the believers also focus on. And so when we do turn to Allah with our prayers, we should have this in our mind. That this is what we are using as a means of connecting to Allah, as a means of asking Him for His blessings and for His bounties. And I've mentioned that He wants us to ask Him for specific things, not just for general things. And once we connect to Him, then the answer, the question of when and how the prayer is answered, it really shouldn't even be a concern of ours. The prayer will always be answered. It may not be answered in the way that we want. But if it is, then we will see Allah's hand in our life. If it is not answered in the way that we want, we will still see Allah's hand in our life. And if we look fairly and justly, it is when our prayer is not answered the way that we wanted, and the way that we expected, that we can more poignantly and more directly see Allah's intervention in our life. That is why Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salatu wa salam has said, Please recite salawat. I got to know my Lord, meaning I was able to relate to my Lord more closely, by the cancellation of my plans. I set out to do something, I wanted to get to a certain destination, and I thought that's what's best for me, this is, this is what I need, this is what I want. And I set out on that path, but when I set out on the journey, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me reach a different destination altogether. When I got to that destination, I realized that where I wanted to go was not even comparable to where I got. And that is one of the best ways for us to realize what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for us, and His grace and His love for us. When He takes us off the path that we wanted to go on, the path that we expected to go on and puts us on an entirely different path altogether. That is where we can see His desire for our well-being. In the end of Surah Al-Furqan, there is a hadith where the Prophet is told to tell the people, قُلْ مَا يَعْبَأُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْلَا دُعَاءُكُمْ Say, O Messenger to the people, My Lord doesn't even give any importance to you were it not for your dua, for your supplication and worship of Him. 
Now, there is another alternative tafsir to this verse, but this is the more accepted and the more comprehensive tafsir and the more proper tafsir of the verse. That Allah is telling the Prophet to tell the people that if it weren't for the fact that you turned to Allah and you realized that your prayers, your needs, they are going to be fulfilled by Allah and that you need to form a connection with Him, then don't think that whatever position you have, prestige, material well-being, whatever resources you have, that is of any concern to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not going to impress Allah. We're not going to bribe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of the worldly titles and all of the worldly categories that we have made for ourselves and for other people, they have no importance. They have no relevance to our material life and well-being in fact especially to our happiness in this life, and especially to our spiritual well-being. If Allah cares for us and is concerned for us, it is only because and it is only to the extent that we have that idea of connecting to Him through dua in our minds. And this connects to many of the teachings of Islam that we have been given by Ahlul Bayt. One of those teachings is the belief in Bada, in the belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He changes our destiny. And He changes our destiny not because His knowledge changes, not because He realizes that, wait a minute, what I had planned until now for the universe, for the world, for this individual person, that wasn't the best plan that I could have made. Let me modify my plans. Let me go back and write a second draft. So this is the destiny of so-and-so version 2.5. No. It's because through our actions and through our dua and supplications, what we are capable of and what we are worthy of and what our soul can bear changes. And when that changes, then of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite mercy will change what He gives us. That is a very important teaching of religion. Without that, religion is simply something dry where we are observing a canvas, observing the natural world around us and saying that, well, whoever made this must have been a truly supreme being, but we don't have any connection to that supreme being. And that is why we have in some ahadith that there was no prophet sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except that they taught that your destiny is changed by your actions, specifically by your dua and your connection with your Creator. That is the beauty of dua. It has nothing to do with getting what we want, having a haja fulfilled, being able to overcome a small challenge or not overcome a small challenge or obstacle in our life. That comes, and Allah has promised that He will take care of those things, and He has promised us that if we are believers, then he will find a way out from all of our problems, no matter how insurmountable, even if we could not imagine such a, a way out to exist. But that is not the purpose, that's not the beauty, that is not the philosophy of dua, and we shouldn't think that that is what is important. If it weren't for your dua, if it weren't for your prayer, if it weren't for your supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah wouldn't even give you a second thought with all that we think we are worthy of, all of the confidence we have in who we are, what we have made of ourselves, we're nothing in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, except if it is through that connection that we want to have. But our challenge though, is to make our voice one of those voices when it reaches that divine company that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his angels, this is one of those voices that I was telling you about. One of those voices that I want to keep hearing. Not one of those voices that I have to figuratively plug my ears for and say, let's get this person whatever they are asking for because we don't want to have them calling on us again. That is why there is also a hadith in which we are told that Allah has addressed the believers and said, when times are good, get in the habit of making dua at that time. Because that is when your voice will become familiar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when times are bad and you're in difficulty, Allah will say to his angels, this is that same voice that has made a habit of speaking to us. Now that he has called on us or she has called on us when times are bad, then give a special attention 
to whatever they are saying and whatever they are asking for and get them through whatever difficulty they are facing. That is one of the ways that we can make sure our voice is one of those voices that Allah will attend to and not one of those voices that Allah will say, I don't want to have this person call on me again and again because they're not interested in a relationship with me. To remember Allah when times are good so that when times are bad and we need Him and we call on Him, He will say that, yes, call, come to me and I will come to you, taking ten steps for every one step that you take towards me. So this is one thing that we should keep in mind. In these conversations with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is about the relationship and that is why in many of these prayers we see that they are different from the prayers that we are used to making. These are prayers of people who are truly turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for everything that they seek in this world and in the hereafter. And one of those things that we need to do in our du'as is to have introspection and to ponder over, recognize our true state and our true vulnerability and then address Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also with regard to our vulnerability and our need that we have for Him. And this is something that I would like to turn to now, but first I would like to introduce this topic in the context also of the story of Prophet Yusuf We mentioned one aspect of the story of Prophet Yusuf yesterday. One of the things that we learn about from the story of Prophet Yusuf is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had in store a great honor and a great dignity for him, not just in the hereafter, but also in this world. And Allah wanted the people of his time to recognize what was unique, what was honorable and chaste about Yusuf. If the entire world wanted to defame him, accuse him of something that he was not guilty of, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to make sure that his purity, his chastity was known to all. And the way that Allah did that was that he brought the king of the realm in which Yusuf was a prisoner after he had been falsely accused. A dream. And in that dream, he saw something that he could not explain. His astrologers and his court scholars, they could not explain. And so Yusuf was sent for, and he sent the true interpretation of that dream. And when the king saw that, he said that, well, call him towards me. So a messenger was sent to the prison, telling Yusuf the king is calling you, he wants to honor you for that knowledge that you granted him of his dream that nobody in his realm was able to give him. And this was a ticket out of prison for Yusuf But he said to the messenger, go back and tell your lord, your king, find out what was the issue for which I was put in prison. What had happened when I was accused of all of those terrible things? And so Yusuf did not come out of prison when he was offered that chance after so many years of captivity. He said that if I was brought into prison, there was a principle involved. And years in prison, even though, as the Qur'an mentions, Yusuf wanted to get out of prison. It wasn't a pleasant or an enjoyable experience, and it wasn't pleasant or enjoyable company, because he was in the company of people who also did not appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship him properly, and so it wasn't pleasant company, it certainly wasn't pleasant circumstances. But he went in there for a principle, and those years of hardship and imprisonment were not able to break him. When he was offered the chance to come out, he said, go and find out what was it that I was put in prison for. I'm not going to simply use an excuse to come out and say, well, I learned my lesson. Last time I talk about principles, last time that I do what's right, that gets you in prison. That doesn't get you any reward. And so the messenger went back to the king. And the king then investigated. And in the course of that investigation, the truth came out. The women who had falsely accused Yusuf, the Imra'at al-Aziz, who had falsely accused uh, Yusuf, the wife of the Aziz, we often call her Zulaikha, but the proper pronunciation is Zalikha. She also bore witness to what had actually happened, and the truth came out. Yusuf alayhi salam, he came out of prison honorably. And he says, 
Now, this is a verse of Quran. Some have attributed it to the wife of the Aziz, Zadikha, and others have attributed it to Yusuf himself. The more appropriate tafsir is to take these verses that I am about to recite as the speech of Prophet Yusuf, because they are speaking of an element of divine guidance and attachment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the Qur'an, this is appropriate to be the message of a prophet or a chosen one of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the words of Yusuf. He says, وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِي إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءِ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي إِنَّ رَبِّي غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ He says that, don't think that I consider myself to be completely free of any vulnerability, blame, temptation. I'm not saying that I am entirely above the fray. Verily, the soul, any human soul, be it the soul of a prophet or an imam or any other human being, it constantly whispers to us to do what is not right. Shaitan, he tries to influence, to mislead all human beings. That is why the prophets and the imams and the chosen servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, men and women, they are an inspiration for us because they are subject to the same creational temptations that we are subjected to. They have that nafs that tries to tell them to do what is not right, but they also have the wisdom, the willpower, the knowledge, and the divine grace that always allows them to overcome their low and their base desires. So Yusuf, he says, don't think that I am saying that I am some special creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not subject to temptation, not subject to any weakness. I'm not saying that I'm above all that. The soul always does invite to do what is evil, except those whom my Lord shows mercy to. Verily, my, my Lord is ghafurun rahim. He is one who covers up weakness. We'll talk about what that means, and merciful. So this is now the basis of our connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our vulnerabilities. Because we are vulnerable by virtue of being human beings. If we do evil, then of course we need to go to Allah to seek forgiveness for what we have done. But even if we do good, we need to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because as we see repeated time and time again in the du'as, especially of our fourth Imam, Imam Zainul Abidin wasalam, where he always emphasizes this concept that, oh Allah, how can I even begin to thank you when every time I open my mouth to thank you, I have to show you another element of gratitude for having been given the honor of knowing that I have to thank you and the ability to say my gratitude and all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the basis of our connection through the recognition of our vulnerability and the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us in protecting us from evil and protecting us from sin and temptation. The connection is stronger, the need for a connection is stronger, the more Allah protects us. We shouldn't just think that, well, when we do wrong, we should take a time out and say, I'm sorry, God, and I'm going to try not to do it again. No, when we do good, that is when we are even more in need of that moment of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is going to direct the rest of our life. Now I'd like to focus on one other part of this story that becomes clear if we look at the previous verse. In the previous verse we read that when Yusuf alayhi salam was explaining why it was that he refused to leave prison and he sent the messenger back and said, go ask your king what had happened back then. He says that the explanation for this is This is so that the king would know that I didn't commit treachery against him when he wasn't there. I was not unfaithful even when there was no one there who would watch over me and be able to tell whether I was doing the right thing or not. And and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not guard or does not uh, guide the scheming of those who are treacherous. This is a general principle. If you are treacherous, if you are not honest in all your dealings, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not help, guide, protect you in any way. You're on your own. And our own devices do not give us any strength. The lesson that we learn from this verse, and it's an extremely important lesson for all believers, is that we have an obligation to make sure that we are protecting our honor and our dignity. Just as we do not have the right to take our own life because we do not own our own life. Our life is a trust given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I am babysitting, say, a nephew or a niece, I can't say that, well, I'll do whatever I want with them. They have parents who are in charge. If the parents have said that they do not eat this or they do not go to this place, they don't watch this television show, then I have an obligation to make sure that I am taking care of them in accordance with what their parents have said. If I don't believe in that manner of parenting or raising, then I can refuse to watch over their kids. But once I have accepted it, I can't say that, well, no, I'm not going to go by your rules, I'm going to go by my own rules. And then there will be quite uh, an angry session when the kids are returned to their parents and they explain what they have done. Our own body is the same way. Our own life is the same way. But just as our physical life is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we all know that suicide is forbidden, we can't end, compromise, weaken, damage the physical body that we have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we also have no right to compromise, weaken the name and the reputation and the honor and the dignity and the karama that we have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not ours. My name, my honor, it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so if I have been falsely accused of something that is going to damage my honor, I can't just say that, well, who cares? Let them say what they will say. It's not their business anyway. If I'm going to be dishonored, given a bad name, then I'm not going to do anything to defend myself. In certain cases, if we have done everything right, then we shouldn't be concerned with our name. We have the hadith that Prophet Musa السلام, he prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Oh Allah, can you grant me this one dua? Don't let people make up these rumors about me. And if you look at history, the rumors that were made about Musa السلام, they were very wicked rumors about even his manhood, about his prophecy, about his motives, about everything possible. Musa السلام, he was subjected to the most vicious smear campaign. His people were, as we all know, the Israelites whose stories are recounted in the Quran and have been lived in history. Those are the ones who were smearing Musa And so he turned to Allah, perhaps in frustration. Oh Allah, can you grant me that people don't say these things about me? And Allah replied to Musa, Musa, this is something that I have not even done for my own name and my own self. People insult me all the time. You want me to protect you from being insulted or badmouthed in any way? How is that possible? So it's not that we have to be worried about our reputation. Because the izzah and the honor that is due to a believer, it is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It isn't even in our own hands. However, we do have an obligation to make sure that we are not compromising our own dignity or allowing our dignity and our honor and our reputation to be compromised unfairly. That is an obligation. If we have done what we need to do to make sure that we have cleared our name when falsely accused, that we have preserved our honor and our dignity in the way that we speak, in the way that we dress, in the way that we interact in society, and then there are still those who are bent upon giving us a bad name, we shouldn't worry about it in the least. That is not in their hands, it is not in their control. But the point is that it is a responsibility that we have. The honor that we have, this is the property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should respect our own honor and of course the honor of every other believer and every other mu'min, brother and sister, as if it is the property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, if we are speaking about another believer, and we are backbiting, or we are gossiping, or we are rumor-mongering, then we should know that not only, as the Qur'an says, are we eating as if it is eating the meat, the flesh of our fellow believer, but we are also defacing the property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just as we take offense, if we come to our masjid and somebody has scribbled improper graffiti on the wall of the masjid, we should not scribble improper graffiti on the face of any of our fellow believers. 
So that is something that we should have always in our mind, but also when it comes to our own dignity. And then when Yusuf السلام, when he cleared his name, then he actually addressed the uh, king and he said to him, قَالَ جَعَلْنِي عَلَىٰ خَزَائِنِ الْأَرْضِ إِنِّي حَفِيظٌ عَلِيمٌ He said to the king, put me in charge of the treasuries of the earth. Verily, I will be able to protect them and I am trustworthy, I am honorable. You have already seen how I have been entirely virtuous and honorable through my previous service and even through the entire time that I was in jail. And so Yusuf والسلام, when he had restored his good name and he had taken the time to preserve his reputation, then he, in a sense, pressed his advantage. And he made sure that that was able to be of benefit to him so that he could then benefit his fellow human beings and the fellow believers of his time by asking for a responsibility for which he was capable and for which he was worthy, that he deserved. So he asked for that ability to serve as the treasurer of the king's domain and to be able to serve to uh, benefit humanity in that capacity. So if we have this trust given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should recognize that by preserving our honor, our dignity, we are actually trying to preserve an investment of the Islamic ummah and the community. We are that investment. And then we should be trying to reach positions of power and influence and ability to benefit people. This is, by the way, one of the verses that was quoted by our 8th Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Rida when he was given that objection that you, the son, the grandson of the Prophet, the grandson of Imam Ali, the grandson of Imam Hussein who was martyred in Karbala, the, the one from the progeny of the Hashemites who gave shuhada like Zayd and Yahya ibn Zayd and Shaheed of Fakh and all these other shuhada, you are going to be the heir apparent of Ma'mun. And the Imam, sometimes he would give a more detailed answer, but one of the short and very concise answers that he would give is he would quote this verse. And he would say, Yusuf ibn Ya'qub, a prophet, the son of a prophet. Ibn Ishaq, the grandson of a prophet. Ibn Ibrahim, the great-grandson of a prophet, four in a line. He went to serve a person, a king who was mushrik. And I am not a prophet, I am a wasi. I am the legatee of a prophet. And I am in, in an apparent sense, in a superficial sense, in the government of a person who is not mushrik, but he is an oppressive and a corrupt ruler within the Islamic ummah. If my being here is going to serve some benefit to the Islamic ummah, then what is your objection? Because we have this verse of the Qur'an. So these are some of the lessons that we learn. We connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through our vulnerability in gratitude and seeking His mercy in order to protect us from temptation. We recognize that there is a natural state, our human condition. It always means that we will be subjected to temptation, but through Allah's help, we can overcome those temptations and we can triumph in whatever spiritual challenges we will face in life. We have a duty to protect our honor and our dignity because it is a divine trust. And once we have maintained our honor and our dignity, we have an obligation to press the advantage in order to be able to be a benefit to ourselves and our fellow Muslims. I thank you for your attention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.